Dasa, Namma Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. Honor to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. We have a very consistent teacher. He's here every week, the Buddha. <laughs> He's here every week. I had a lot of fun. No, we have to wait for May to show up here if she's coming. I wonder if she's coming. I don't think she's coming because it is too late. Now one hour uh, day saving time has come up. So it would be close to midnight now for her. Okay, and so um, she will not come. So we can and Umar, start, uh, Umar is here, and I still haven't replied to Umar. Umar. So let me let me just say something, Umar. If you're there, I want to tell you I'm going to write you before bed tonight. That's the plan. But my plans keep crashing. I have to go to doctors and diagnostics and all kinds of good stuff right now, and I am not in good shape. I'm happy, but I'm sore, <laughs> and. Um, so I uh, will get to it, probably try to write you something tonight. If you cannot write, uh, you can send me an audio, then I will transcribe it myself. Yeah, the problem is uh, somebody might be coming tonight, but I can still probably do it. But I probably have an hour to do after I finish with this. So I'll, I'm going to see what happens. Okay. Otherwise, we'll put you in the front of the line for tomorrow morning. Okay, it's a very pretty simple thing to, but I want to talk to you. I don't want to just send you an audio, okay? Okay, uh, so I will um, connect with you, okay? Um, let's see, where are we? Okay, what we had planned to do tonight, but the people who really wanted to know aren't here. <laughs> this is funny. Oh boy, okay, so it's kind of a toss up. Uh, how many of you, I have to ask you to tell me, uh, but how many of you actually want to do the second part of the, um, of the 149? You know, the reason I'm asking is because it's sort of like when Bhante teaches that I went back because I was wanted to be sure about it. It's only been recorded one time where it's hanging up. It has the... Um, transcript is there with it in the library in the Majima Nikaya section 149 is there but the whole thing about 149 am I talking about 149 I think I am no I'm sorry what was I talking about no 77 I'm sorry 77 um, the whole thing about the second part of the sutta the second half of the 77 um, if we go back to the beginning of the sutta, um, I think you're going to find out this is basically being, um, he's, he's really talking about the uh, practice and he's discussing it with these wanderers and everybody. And, um, but he's doing it in, the ter in terms of the monastic thing. When I went in and reviewed this, I'm there, he's doing it for the monastics it's not as if he's teaching us it's not it's more like he's teaching the uh Udayan and he's teaching the disciples and explaining the dis discussing the whole teaching with Udayan of what he's teaching to the the uh disciples and the thing about it is when we have over the years Bhante has taught this he doesn't teach the other part there's a couple reasons number one uh, it has the section I'm talking about, we, we were left off on page 638, okay, in the Majima Nikaya, and we stopped at the eight liberations. So the eight liberations are kind of okay, but they're not that clear. And the uh, transcendence, the eight bases of transcendence, these things are coming, that's coming out of the Visuddhimagga. And then the 10, ten casinas, and uh, the both the both the basis of transcendence and the ten casinas are about the casino topic, and what I'm trying to get across to you is nobody teaches casinas anymore in the traditional way. It's lost. It's been lost. So if anybody's teaching it, they're putting together stuff and trying to teach it. But actually, we have a pretty clear understanding in Asia there isn't a location you can go to to have the original casino training taught. Now, when you look at casinas, 
So I'm going to probably just talk about this stuff. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because I have something else for you too. Um, the casinas itself is a one-pointed concentration. So if, I'm just saying if, the Buddha was teaching uh, the, the, um, the tranquil wisdom meditation for the people and such, it wouldn't make sense to be teaching them casinas and the people weren't practicing the casinas, but this was a monastic thing. The monastics were spending the time to do the casino during the casino practice. And it takes a long time, you know, to work, to work through you. Now you don't have to go through all of them. You don't have to go through all of them, but the problem is that you can't find a teacher to teach you anymore. That's a genuine, a genuine casino teacher. I would love Ulysses if you would ask Bika Bodhi sometime about whether the, there are teachers anywhere that ask them that question, you know, whether there are teachers anywhere um, that teach the casino that he knows of and let us know what you find out. Um, so we look at it and say, we don't want you to do that. And we are funny when you're learning, when you're learning the um, tranquil wisdom insight meditation, we're very strict about saying, if we're going to work with you as a teacher or guide, as we're, if we're going to guide you through, it gets extremely difficult when you start mixing in other kinds of practices and habits that you picked up from those practices and you attempt to do this practice and it just doesn't work. And the main thing that causes most of the problem for tranquil wisdom insight meditation to work is one point of concentration and absorption training before or where you were concentrating really hard on something. So, I mean, I what I did with this when um, we were looking at it, I took a plate and I coated it with dirt and I put it um, on a tree in front of another tree and I sat under the tree and worked with it a while. And what I came away with from the casino work was, well, I could do that before when I was at camp, I could look at a light bulb and imprint it in my head and have the picture of the light bulb and open my eyes and still carry around the picture of the light bulb. But what actually is happening in your brain when you're practicing this way is you're training your brain to do this. And the whole point of the Buddhist training was to train your mind to open up so that you could watch inside everything that's happening. So when you talk about if, if it, I had a big discussion with a Pali scholar today and it had to do with one word, one word that can change the meaning entirely of the front part of the Satipatthana Sutta. If you're talking about the Khandas and you're talking about them uh, and you say, I want you to practice the body, understand the, to understand the body as the body. So if we look at the first page of the 10, it, it is um, contemplating, abides contemplating or reflecting on the body as a body, ardent, fully aware, and mindful. This is the first page of Satipatthana Sutta. Now, what is interesting about this, that makes perfect sense. And, it's, and it, it weaves into all the other teaching that the Buddha is teaching about learning to see things actually as they are, to see them, hear them, smell them, taste them, touch, uh, and understand things as they are without thinking and analyzing and bringing back past memories and saying, is it like this or is it like that? Just seeing and experiencing everything as it is. That makes sense. However, if you change one word, one word, and it's a little word with two letters, if you change the word to contemplating the body in the body, I have had people who read people that write that translation. And if you see that translation or you find it somewhere in a sutta, it makes you stop and think, what are they doing? Is that real? So I was talking to the Pali scholar because I'm trying to find out, is there a word that means in and a word that means as? Because if you say, please, I want you to learn to look at your body as a body, just a body. And I want you to learn that feeling is just a feeling, not me, not mine, not myself, not who I am. It is just body, feeling, perception, 
thoughts and consciousness. And when we examine those five aggregates, we see them as they are. That is the actual Buddhist, Buddhist teaching, the Buddha Dhamma teaching, okay? But when I say to you, I want you to contemplate the body in the body, I want to find out if when we, when we see that, is it actually in the Pali or is it a mistake? Is it something that somebody decided to do? And if they did decide to do it, is it because they were practicing a lot about um, the internal part? You know, where you contemplate in the Satipatthana, where you internal understand something by the internal and the external. What does that mean? It means I is the internal and the forms are the external out there. The ear is the internal ear and the external sound. So the six sense doors, they have an internal and external part. So it's really interesting about that. So that's, that's a clear kind of training what the Buddha was trying to get us to come down to earth and just look at things as they are. Now, remember, uh, I don't know if I did it with you or who I did it with. <laughs> I taught the past, the future, and the present. When I teach you that, uh, that uh, past and future and present, I draw a line and I have a little car. I, I started by using a little bead on a string and the bead on the string, that's the present time. And you're moving through life like this on, on the little, on the tiny little bead. It's like, if I use, I have this thing here, let me show you. It's like, if I, if I put this one, uh, this little one, see this little cap for something. So here's the line at the bottom of the picture. And here I'm born and I'm gonna move along the line like this. So everything back here is the past and everything up there is the future. Now, the problem the Buddha was trying to explain to all of us is we suffer an awful lot if when we're sitting here in the present time where you're in this class right now, but you can't concentrate on what I'm saying because somebody yelled at you in the past this morning or yesterday or last week or something in your mind from the past is jumping into the present, the present space. But here's the funny thing. The only place you are alive, if you look it up, <laughs> alive, the word, is in the present time. The present time is the only spot. Now, we can get smaller and say present moment. But nobody, everybody thinks it's a little cliche that people say. And you can't see the present moment. You can if you practice for a couple years and you really get your observation going and you're sitting in infinite consciousness, you can see, yeah, you can see the present moments happening. Consciousness is popping up and going down. Okay, you can, you can watch it. But the everyday person, when you're trying to explain to this to them, you can say to them, hey, you can chill in life if you stay here and live in this as it's moving along. That's your present time space. It's like me sending the kids to nursery school and nursery school and first grade are the time when the children learn that the most important thing for them to survive as they're growing up is to remember they have this space around them. The space around them is what they are responsible for. And we will say to the children, mind your space in Sunday school. Don't get into his space or into her space mind your space and then everyone will mind their space and behave in the class. That's how a Sunday school used to work when I was teaching Sunday school. This is the same idea that Buddha is saying, can you stay in this present time space for one day? And when you try to do it, what happens is that you will um, fall in and out. You'll, you'll realize if you watch yourself, why am I jumping on this person because he's doing this? But I immediately go and I say, you know, we always did that back here. So this must be what he's doing. So we don't even give other people the space or ourselves to change, do we? Because we are living through reflection of what we know happened before with people we meet. And that's where we get into trouble with relationships with 
uh, male, female, you know, male, male, female, female, family, friends, everything. That's where we get in trouble. That's where we get in trouble. So he's saying to the monks many times in the suttas throughout, practice, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. What is happening is just happening and it's happening here in the present time. And as this moves, it will pass away and it becomes the past behind you. So what happened this morning, even an hour ago, it's in the past. So the more enlightened a person is, the more developed they are, um, you see them, this is what they're doing. This is how they're living. You know, um, oh, what's his name? Let's see, I can't remember. Uh, he was a, gosh, he was a, um, sorry, let me get some water. He, he was a, um, a monk that lived through the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Okay, and it's it, it Gosananda. His name was Gosananda. He's deceased now. He's a very famous monk because he was in the village and the soldiers came in and they were going to kill everybody. And what they did was they took all the women, the children, and the old men, and uh, they put them in one house and he was with them. And then they were going to shoot him. And they knew that they were going to all die. And while they're jammed together in this house, uh, one this captain, he came in and he's going to take this, this uh, pathetic old man and he's going to take him outside and shoot him. And so Gosanan is, don't take him, take me. You know, in a socialistic controlled society, that's really dictatorship and all that. That was the worst thing he could have said to him because nobody is supposed to think about anybody else if you're in a society that's from a dictatorship. You're only supposed to think about the government. And so they decided to make an example of him. They did not take the old man, but the captain uh, looked at this man and he couldn't scare him. So what they did was strip him. So he only had a little bit of rags on and put him on the ceiling and put him inside a, a chain link fence hooked to the ceiling and said, let's see how long you can last up there and what kind of effect you have on people. And they were, they were giving him a little bit of water in the dark at night to keep him alive, but he would never change the way he was. He only wanted to help the people. He was completely in the present time. We asked him what he did while he was hooked to the ceiling. And it was like three or four days is what I understand. Three or four days hooked to the ceiling and not allowed to get down for anything. And they were, like I said, giving him a tiny bit of water, saving a tiny bit of food, trying to keep him alive. And he said, I was just sending loving kindness and forgiveness to the captain. He was so pathetic. I was sending him forgiveness and loving kindness the whole time. Well, what happened was the army decided to just leave. They just left. They didn't even know, they was told that he didn't even know for like almost 24 hours, they had just left and the door was open. They didn't burn the house down. They just left them there. And then they took him off the ceiling and he became very famous because of this. But he, when he was older and he was living in Connecticut, um, my teacher went to visit him and he said, the thing about Gosananda was he never knew what day it was. He never knew the date. He had no interest in the date. He had no interest in anything. It wasn't because he was senile. It wasn't because dementia. He was living completely developed to the point where he simply was living in this present moment. So the two things the Buddha is teaching us overall, the two things he's telling us about when he's teaching us is, can you leave the past behind completely? You think you can, but go through a day and then look at it at the end of the day, look at where you just went and see how many times you decided to speak back to someone or handle something or do something because that's always the way it's, it's happened, all the, always the way it is. And so you treated somebody in return uh, based on how they always behaved. And the other place that we worry is not just about this past, but it's also about this future over here. We worry, worry, worry about the future and we get so consumed about, oh my gosh, 
what might happen, what could happen. And we're so worried about that, we're not here anymore. See? But when we're here in this present time, this is fascinating. You are completely free. You are completely alive. You're not with the weight on your back of the past, not anything, no big bag of stuff worrying about it on the front of you. You're just right there in the present time. This is a practice. You should, you should practice it in the daytime and look at it at night and say, did I do that or was I caught? Did I, did I accidentally do something where I was just behaving from the same way all the time? So, so that's a couple things. Okay, so the um, pieces about the transcendence and the next page, the casinas, basically are about one point of concentration. They narrow the mind and we don't use them. We don't, we aren't interested in them. What we're interested in is opening the mind. Then he talks about the jhanas in this in the sutta. And the jhana isn't any new information. He's going through it again. And he's simply talking about how the uh, uplifted joy comes up. He's going through the different levels. And he's, um, when you're totally present and you're in these, but the way he, they talk about these jhanas reflect more, if you read it, kind of reflect a bit more toward the concentration jhanas than, uh, than what we're doing. It's a little bit different. It uses words differently. If you go and you look at it sometime. All right, and then whenever there's an insight knowledge that is printed in amongst the Satipatthana Sutta, we were told this is not part of the Sutta. This is the explanation of what it meant based on the commentaries from somewhere. Now, one of the questions that came up this week was I mentioned um, Majima Nikaya and I was talking to you. And then a little bit later, I said Majima Nikaya, the Attika, M A is, can you say it, Bunty? I can't remember how to say it, but that is the commentary that was done on the Majima Nikaya set up. And then later on, after they're debating about it and everything, there was. I'm a, not sure about her. Uh, okay, there's, there's two two that were made, and the first one is the what is it? Atatika. When it says tika at the end of it, I can look. I can show you right here. Wait tika, a second. Huh? Yeah, when they there's say commentaries. based on the tika, it means that it's based on commentary. It's not part of it. So when we look in here, we see um, M A is Majima Nikaya Atakata. That's the first. <laughs> the Atakata, and that's the first one. And then there's another another one that was done on the Majima Nikaya, but I'm not sure if that one is, yeah, here it is, MT. MT is Majima Nikaya Tika. So if it's MT that the note is about, it's from the Tika. And I think the Tika came first, is that right? Or the second? One of them came and then the other one I'm came. Not sure, huh? I'm and not what sure. this is disputing uh, as time goes on after the Buddha goes into Parinibbana, okay, um, when he passes away physically, um, he's not there. <laughs> the teacher is gone. And so we're left on our own to figure out and things. And as the generations of monks come up, it's human beings. And human beings start debating, was it this way? Was it that way? And then you have somebody very charismatic who shows up like Buddha Gosa. And when he shows up, he builds a commentary and he must have been really something. Uh, because when you read about this with uh, Kalupahana, Professor Kalupahana, I told you before, he spent nearly 70 years investigating two subjects. One was about what exactly did Buddha Gosa do? And the other was what exactly happened um, with um, the school of emptiness with, um, who was it? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> the other one. Um, and those two, those two subjects in history uh, the one that started the school of emptiness, which when you hear most people talk about it, it's not what the Chula Shunyata Sutta said. I just heard this week, I listened to someone teach the Chula Shunyata Sutta and they didn't go to the end of the Sutta. I thought it was pretty unique. And when they, they taught it, they never got to the end. And actually the punchline for the Chula Shunyata Sutta 
is the fact that there is no emptiness as to what is you are void of this and void of that and as to everything that is not there what we know for sure is this is present so you never get to empty but the school of emptiness was arguing in a way where many people from that school if you talk to them they speak of emptiness um, as almost equal to nibbana and it's not the same thing so over time, there's been a lot of disputes and reshaping of what is Nibbana. And you would not, when I tried to study Nibbana for a while, just what is Nibbana was, the investigation started out as what is Nibbana? And uh, it's a place with no, no concepts, but you can't say place. And you can't say it's a, it's a heaven or anything like that. And it goes on and on what they've done to it. One person has a story where it's a city. When you die, you'll go to that city. That's like similar to Pure Land Buddhism, but not quite the same. I've had heard that story. Then you hear um, amazing things about if you become an arahat, one of them is you will have no arrogant, uh, ar I'm sorry, no aggregates anymore. They'll be gone. I mean, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> You know, the five aggregates are the body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. How can you decide to tell people that if you become an arahat, you won't have any aggregates anymore? I think what they mean, where it comes from, is you won't be concerned with any of it anymore. You won't be concerned with it. You will know the body as a body, just a body. You know, uh, you will know feeling as simply something that arises in the chain of human cognition and always passes away. Okay, feeling is feeling. Perception is the part of the brain that names what it is that came up and if you're a human being and you become an arahat, you're not going to just disappear. And when the one person said this, I went, well, wait a second, wait a second. This Buddha, he walked around and he taught for 45 years. So he did not disappear. He was teaching, right? Uh, so that's a little mixed up. So body, feeling, perception, thoughts. If you have a body, your brain is going to continue to work and thoughts are going to still come up, right? Of course. And consciousness, well, you know, perception, feel, feeling perception and consciousness, those three are conjoined, conjoined, not disjoined. This is in Sutta number 43. If you go in there and you find this in Sutta number 43, um, this is conjoined, not disjoined. It's on page 389. You need to read that whole section. It's very short. You start with, you start on page, start on page 388 and where it says consciousness, then read about feeling and then read about perception. And then it says feeling, perception and consciousness, friend, these states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them. Now this gets interesting because in the text, uh, when somebody is trying is working on getting to Nibbana, what does it say in most of the suttas? And Bhante changes it now because we can't believe, we can't accept it because feeling, perception, and consciousness are conjoined. It means that they are like this. See my fingers? It's like a molecule, the tips of my fingers. You cannot, you cannot uh, be conscious unless you can perceive your conscious and feel it. You cannot perceive something unless there's uh, you're conscious and there's a, a feeling. And you cannot feel something unless you can you are conscious to feel it and you can perceive it. This is why these three are conjoined. Therefore, mathematically, in a formula, it is impossible to simply say um, that cessation state is when uh, feeling and perception stops. It's feeling perception and consciousness. And when you have a real blackout 
when you fall into cessation, there are blackouts and there are actual when you fall into cessation. Now, I don't know, is there anybody here who didn't see the map of the jhanas that you don't understand that? Let's see, I know Ardika did, and I think Dr. Weira did, and Susan, I think, did too in Singapore, okay. Umer, do you know about that? You know how when you're going, uh, you're falling from one jhana to another, see the deception people have uh, is sometimes people believe I have to get there. It's the best way not to get there, <laughs> okay, <laughs> is to want this. It's Buddhist, the practice itself is kind of funny because it's like you're a little child and you want to make, you want to get there. And most of us, because of our culture and the um, trying to compete and be the best and all that and acquisition, we want to say to somebody, I got there, I did this, I made it happen. When the fact is, the only way it can happen is if I personally get out of the way and there's nothing left and just watch with my brain, my mind inside, okay? Just watch what happens and anything that comes that I would get interested in to pull me away, you don't engage it at all. You simply let it go, relax, smile, and come back. That's how you get there. That's how you move down the path very quickly. But that's, it's easy to say. It's difficult to do because we have so many natural habits from growing up. That's the problem. And most of it is atta. It's thinking, Everything that is happening is me, it is mine, it is myself, even it is who I am. And that's wrong. It's not. This is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. That's the practice. And this is another one. If you say, what can I do during the day to keep the practice going to help myself evolve? Try doing it all day. This is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. This is just what this is at my desk and I have to do it here in the present time. And when I'm done, I put it over there, I do something more. This is something that you can make life so much easier if you can master this and try to um, get, get it done. I know it can be frustrating, I had some, Bunty and I talked and I made a list and I said to him, I'm going to try really hard to do this list <laughs> just yesterday. And so I had to find three people. Well, the address for one is good. The address for the others, nobody knows where they are. <laughs> this is really funny. And then um, there was another thing and um, I had to remember to call someone. When I called them, they were teaching online and they were going to call me back. And then, of course, they forgot to call back. So, you know, we're human beings. We got to forgive ourselves. We have to be compassionate and not get angry at ourselves. We have to keep smiling, keep smiling because, okay, so it's not, it's not happening. Okay, let it go and keep in the present time. That's the best way and keep smiling. And don't get angry at yourself if you're pulled away in the original instructions for TWIM, it says if you're pulled away 50 times and you have to do the six R's 50 times, that's not a bad practice. This is what people don't understand. That's a good practice because every time you do the cycle of the six R's, you are training the brain again and again and again. And pretty soon what happens is that the um, five faculties, for instance, faith, energy, mindfulness, the level of your concentration or collectedness of mind and wisdom, pretty soon you've been adjusting that and it just does it automatically. Why did it go to automatic? How did it shift to automatic? It changed because you kept doing the six R's exactly the same, six steps 
same every single time. If you change them around or try to make them go faster or think they're gonna work better, if you shift them around, it doesn't work. Because the way the brain works to be retrained at anything is through repetition. And I just read an article, this is really interesting. Um, it's at the same place I tell you to go on the Google and put in how long does it take to change a habit if you're an adult, just put that in there. And one of the research things that comes up, they have now tested how long does it take? So they kept it going long enough for people to actually change habits and they found on their chart, 66 days. And I went, I can't believe it because my students that actually change completely their behavior pattern and it it's really completely fixed are the ones that do it in 60 days. So I thought this is really neat. They're confirming what we're finding in the, in the teaching. It's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Okay, mind made body. Now, the next, the, the, we, we said the insight knowledge is basically the Vasudhi Maga explaining to you what's going on. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong. You have to gradually you'll understand what's right and wrong because what is right and what is wrong it's right if it's operating correctly and you're moving down the path and you know it it's wrong if it's not moving on the path and you, you you're not making progress that's what the buddha told ananda so mind made body all i can get out of this every time i read it is that you are light enough and clear enough and perfected enough in knowledge and wisdom and everything that the, um, the some people have this natural tendency to have an outer body experience happen. Now you can get to that point as an arahat. These, these itties, these are called the itties. And when we talk about these powers, these are things that the sometimes anagamis with uh, fruition can do some of these things that the lesser ones are okay but the more difficult ones they're not going to happen except for a person who reaches arahat and is pure enough that they're not going to make any mistake and they're not going to believe anything that happens when you when you get involved in this stuff is real so because if you do past lives for instance and you have a deep past life experience what comes up is so real. You can taste it, touch it, smell it. You think you're there. And you have to completely have equanimity balanced so, so completely that your heart doesn't start pumping and your fear doesn't come up and your stomach doesn't jump if something awful is, is happening in where you are. So they're not always quiet little visits to a past life experience. Okay, so the mind made body, um, the way it's described is a perfect description of this is a snake. This is the slough. The snake is one, the slough is another. That means when the snake sheds its skin, it's a duplicate of that um, snake. And what the snakes do to get the slough to slide off is they stop eating and they, they, contra they um, contract, concave their bodies and the slough will come off when it's time. And sometimes it's perfect, looks like a whole snake. Um, and that's all I can tell you about that. Uh, you know, um, it's mind made, it's a duplicate of you and it's a spirit, it's a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, energy body. And there are ways to learn how to do that. And then there are things you need to understand about the rules and the laws and everything of doing it. It's not just something you can do and it's fun and you're always gonna get back to your body. You have to be careful. So, all right, the, not, the kinds of supernormal powers. These are the supernormal powers where, and this has some funny stories in it of the Arahats were living together with the Buddha and, um, in this one location on a mountain 
And the temple was up on the side of the mountain, but there was this really nice field and a place to speak like a shelter at the bottom. So everybody went down to the shelter to have the Buddha speak and he was gonna teach something very important. And they were missing a monk. And so he said to the, one of the other monks, go up and get the monk. And he didn't know what was going on. So he just said, go up and get the monk, knock on the door and tell him to come down here. Now we're all supposed to be here. And so this is what we do, by the way, if you don't show up for the Dhamma talk in the morning, nobody can do it through the, go through the uh, morning service and sit unless you're there, we can't start the day. And if you don't show up at a Dhamma talk when you're at the center, we, no, we can't have a Dhamma talk unless everybody in the center is there. So this is something that's been carried down. And so the monk ran up the hill and he knocked on the door. And this monk opens the door and he looks around and he's, he's first he says, you have it come down for the Dhamma talk. And then he notices there's a monk on the stairwell who's cleaning the stairs and a monk near the refectory cleaning the kitchen and a monk on the other side cleaning the altar. And he doesn't know what it is, but the monk, okay, I'll be right there, he says. And um, he, he closes the door and he goes down and he tells the, the Buddha said, what was he doing? And then he said, what happened? And he said, no, 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 listen carefully, go back up, knock on the door at this time, at the door, clap your hands really hard. So he goes and he knocks at the door and the monk opens up the door and he says, you have to come. And he goes like that and they all go. Phew. And then they walk down the mountain together and he hears the Dhamma talk. So this is one of the things that's supposed to be one of the 80s that can happen to a person, okay? Another one is that the person can, um, um, these were described, the one I just told you, having been one, they become many, and having been many, they become one. They appear and they vanish. They go unhindered through the walls, through enclosures, even walk through mountains as though, um, it was space, a space element. And they can dive in and out of the earth as though it was water. That's, that's complete um, knowledge and control of the water element. And they can walk on water without sinking through it as if it was earth, again, mastering the water element. And they can sit cross-legged and travel in space like birds. And this is like where you're sitting in meditation, in the meditation position, you're just sitting and then you become so incredibly light because you let go, let go, let go, let go. And as you do that, your body weight is less because there's less tension. The, um, the um, human body is very interesting because you have a great deal of water in your body. Bunty, what is it? Is it 70% seven, or more, isn't it, of water, I think? Um, and the reason that you can, uh, you have tension in your body is, is, uh, the, you can feel your body at all is from tension. And this all makes sense because when you get to the third jhana, you start to lose feeling in your body and you lose it in your hands first and your feet. And it travels up your arms and legs. It reaches to your torso. It goes up your torso to your neck. You go through a period most people don't want to give up their head, <laughs> you know? So it's like your head is here on a table and that's all that's there. That's the way if you try to, just for a split second, is this real? And many people have gone for a split second and poked their thigh to see if it's, they can still feel it. If you're practicing aware jhanas, when you make contact with your finger poking your, your thigh, you can feel it but then you can just continue sitting. If you keep going with the body disappearing, that's the tension falling out of your body. And that's why you can't feel it anymore because of all the water inside you. This is how it works. So that is the part about the, um, um, the different parts of the itties and what they can do. Now they say, for instance, the Anagami who was Deepama, she's gone now, but Deepama, they say could dive into the ground 
and pop up in New York and ask her teacher something and then pop back down and come back and pop up in India again. <laughs> but they, a lot of people said, yes, she can do that. She can do it. And they had uh, cases where they were asking people and matching up things. Next one was divine ear element. And what do you do with the divine ear element? Okay. One thing, you don't have to be an arahat to have the divine ear uh, or open up or sometimes the divine eye to start to open up. But what would you do with the divine ear element? Maybe you don't believe in hell and the teacher might decide if you have a very strong form of equanimity in place, and this is the key to these things, that it would be okay for you to sit in meditation and do a determination, I'm gonna sit in hell and sit in hell. When you get down there, you'll be sitting next to somebody and just ask them, why are you here? What did you do? And you start learning, you start learning basically about, about uh, the karma and witnessing why a person is actually there. That's one of the things you can do. And it's a shocker. If, it, if you actually can pull this off, it's a, it's a shock. Okay, then um, another thing about the um, divine ear is you can find out what your relatives did in the past. I mean, way past past, like two, 300 years back. That's interesting. Um, and another one is the uh, past lives. This is the recollection of past lives. Now they talk about it in here. It's not always like manifold lives, one birth, two birth, three births. There was a girl in, I can't remember where, I think she was in Malaysia. One of Bonte's students about 15, 20 years back who was able to um, go through thousands and thousands of years, like the Buddha would talk about eons and stu uh, stuff like that, and claimed that she could go back and go back and go back and go back in detail. This is something, I'm not gonna say you have to believe it. <laughs> this is part of the deal with this, all of this is if you experience it, don't get shook up by it, it can happen, you know? And if it does, you kind of, uh, don't take it like one woman started losing her her body, the feeling in her body while she was sitting in meditation in Sri Lanka and came to the interview and told us, I can give you the answers to the question for the interview, but then I have to go to the hospital very quickly. And we said, why? She said, I think that I have the signs of a heart attack coming. I can't feel my arms. And for us, it, we were delighted because she was fine. Her blood pressure was fine. She was perfectly all right. She was beginning to lose her body, feeling with her body and never had it happen before in her life. Was meditating for years and years and years. She was in her sixties. And um, then she got used to it and she liked to sit in that state. When you sit without a body, what happens? What happens in your body? Well, think about the pressure that's on your body and different parts of systems in your body. And if you're sitting with no tension and tightness at all and keep smiling and smiling and the body is feeling better and better, it's healing itself. It's a good way if you're ever in an accident to let yourself fall into the third jhana and just be there till people come to help you and just accept whatever this is and you're going everything's in each of anyway, so it's gonna change and don't get upset and don't get scared and get through traumatic experiences that way. It's a very good tool. Um, another one was the, the understanding of minds of others, which is not something I would wish on anybody uh, because sometimes a student will try really hard to develop this, they'll get it started and they can't turn it off. And it's not cool. It's not something somebody else can turn off. And if it opens up, it can be a difficult thing. That's, these are the sorts of things you want to have a, a guide around to help you or get you to someone who's really good at guiding a person in order to 
do it without having any problems, any accidents or real upsets or fear coming up and things like that. We talked about re re recollection of past lives. What is a functional way to use recollection of past lives? The development of recollection of past lives is all being written about now. Very interesting. Some people are writing some books about using the recollection of past lives in order to get over phobias. So if you have a fear of heights or you have a fear of water or a fear of, um, of falling or something like that, if you go into past lives, you might find out that in other past lives of other beings, they were dying off, the ones that come up, all of them were from falling. So when you come away from that, you say, but that was then, and this is now, and I understand what this is, and probably this isn't going to have, this doesn't have anything to do with my life. Um, you know, it just has to do uh, with, um, with what happened to the people in, in uh, past lives. So it's nothing to do with you, okay? So the recollection of past lives, okay. Then the next one was divine ear. And so all these are clustered into this one sutta in the back part of 77. And divine ear is interesting. Divine ear is where a person can hear voices. And if you listen very carefully, if they're telling you very good things and important things and things that make a lot of sense, they can be very helpful. You have to check it out and make sure they're not anybody else that's coming to try to let you listen to them. But if you have a good one, it's very chance that that's like a Deva that wants to help you. And I personally, I'm Irish in my background. So I believe in the little people and I believe in Devas and angels and things like that. So I don't have any problem with this. Some people have problems with it, with um, believing that something's possible, but science hasn't told you yet how it works. Well, I'm sorry, you're missing, you're missing a lot because sometimes uh, you look for the reason and look for how it works, but sometimes you end up with something you can't explain and it can be a very good thing. Um, the last part is it talks to you about the destruction of the taints, okay? Now I'll tell you what the eight liberations were because I notated them in the back of the sutta. So if you want to write these down, you can, um, you can write them down. I'll do them very slowly. Uh, the first one is um, you understand that you are possessed of material form and you see forms and the attainment. Um, you get this when you're practicing the Rupa Jhanas is when it goes completely into your mind clearly that material form and you uh, and you see material forms in, in the practice during the Rupa Jhanas. The second one is you are not possessed of material form anymore. And the external forms in the Rupa Jhanas, the external object is there, but it's not disturbing you at all. It's simply you're able to, to watch it or hear it, or, but it's not disturbing you anymore. The third one Third liberation is resolved only on the beautiful. And the fourth jhana, um, you have a very strong, solid equanimity that comes in. And you, you can keep this going if you pay attention to it. And you keep your precepts and you're, you keep, you're very clear. And you can keep it going, keep working with it during the day. It's interesting to experience. Sometimes it will stick with you for a long time, meaning a week or two like that. The fourth one is disappearance of gross perceptions of sensory impact. Okay, we don't say the disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact. We say the disappearance of gross perceptions of sensory impact because the difference is we're aware when we're in the jhanas and we have linked together the use of in, when you're doing the twin practice, you have a clear understanding of how you are practicing serenity and insight yoked evenly together, okay? Simultaneously, this is going on. And the way it works is someone wrote and said, that's ridiculous. You can't have an insight if you're in, um, 
if you are uh, in the jhanas like this and you have lost your feeling, uh, but you can, when we're practicing, you lose your feeling. But if I were to touch you, you would just come right out, undisturbed, no stress, no um, loss of energy, and just say, yes, what do you need? Oh, there's a phone call, your dad's on the phone, it's something serious, okay, thank you. I'll tell him I'll call back and you go right back into your sitting. And there's no disturbance. When you're finished, you're sitting, um, you would just get up and walk away and there's no reason to stretch, no reason to get stiff. You aren't stiff, you aren't tired, you just are finished and you decided to come out of your practice. There's the disappearance of the hindrances is what's happening in the fourth liberation. And you're abiding in infinite space, which is the first level of the mental jhanas. The fifth one is surmounting infinite space. You enter into and abide in infinite consciousness. That's the fifth liberation. If you've worked with us as guides, we're talking to you about infinite consciousness. There are things you can do when you're in the state of infinite consciousness to see the more internal parts, the internal part of the body function in the brain by watching consciousness as arise and and be born and die and born and die and born and die constantly and see how they operate. Surmounting the infinite consciousness enters abides in the, the state of nothingness, okay? And then sitting nothingness is observing. It's an interesting thing. I'm gonna hire you to sit there and tell me what nothingness is. What is nothing? So again, this is referring to the Chula Shunyata Sutta and the last part, last statement in um, that Sutta that is, is really so important because that's the whole point of the Sutta is to get to that point where he says, thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus this is present. I also, I got interested in this because MIT figured out there's no such thing as a vacuum and the people at NASA agree that space is not empty. And when we ask, press them as to what is it they think they found, something intelligent, they can't really describe it. So we were always talking about cosmic goo <laughs> when I was growing up. Nobody could get to the answer of what is this, what is that, everything else. And I think that's where they went with this. They would just say something is there that's an intelligent something. That was all they would say. The next one is completely surmounting um, the... Um, surmounting the, um, okay, surmounting the level of nothingness and entering and abiding in the neither perception or non-perception, okay? And when you're in neither perception or non-perception, the marker for this, for you to kind of realize something's happening here, I number one, you're sitting usually for two, three hours. And, um, when you're sitting in neither perception or non-perception, you can't perceive it, but you're not not perceiving it. And when you, you can't identify with this, what's really happening in the sutta until you come out of the sutta and remember, you kind of remember what happened. And you remember you saw pink, you saw a pattern in blue, you saw some kind of fabric thing go by. You saw a light arise and fall. As soon as you remember anything, you 6R, 6R. So this is abandon it. And what you're doing is emptying out the memory, emptying out the memory, emptying out the memory, and just letting everything go. That's how you treat neither perception or non-perception. Completely surmounting neither perception or non-perception, he enters and abides in cessation and the state of cessation is basically turning off. And the only way we 
can identify, usually if the person comes in after this happens, I can see the difference. The teacher can see the change in the person. They're bright, they're open, relaxed, no tension, no tightness in their body, in their face, head, anything. Nobody can pull this off. It's not something you can fake. You can see this difference. And you'll ask the question, did anything strange happen in this practice? And a lot of times the answer will be, everything just stopped. And then if you go a little further and ask a couple of questions that we ask, um, it will narrow down. Yeah, this is definitely, this is cessation that happened. And we check, have a few checking, checkup questions we ask you. Now, this is the consummation and perfection of direct knowledge is the completion of these eight pieces. And what is interesting about these eight liberations, they are like other things that are written about in the text. Okay, and TWIM allows you to complete all eight of these. So does anybody have any questions about this so far? Um, because I had one other thing I was going to show you, but I need somebody to say something. Anybody have any questions? Hmm? No questions, okay. I thought it would be nice to read something to you that is from 149. 149 is a very nice sutta and um, it's very special, the sixfold base, uh, the great sixfold base. It is the, the Maha Salyatanaka Sutta, okay. And I'm going to read it to you with a little bit of the abbreviations, not go through over and over again, the repetitions. But if you read this, I can send it to you all. Um, when you hear this, it's so good because it shows you really what the Buddha was teaching. And why are you doing this? And where is it taking you? What's going to happen? Yeah. Okay, and thus I have heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetis Grove in Athapindigas Park when he addressed the monks thus saying, Bhikkhus, Venerable Sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this, Bhikkhus, I shall teach you a discourse on the great sixfold base. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, the monks replied, and the blessed one said this. When one does not know and see the eye as it actually is, when one does not know and see the forms as they actually are, when one does not know and see eye consciousness as it actually is, when one does not know and see eye contact as it actually is, when one does not know and see as it actually is the feeling felt as pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant that arises with eye contact as condition, then one is inflamed by lust for the eye, for forms, for eye consciousness, for eye contact, for the feeling that is felt as pleasant or painful or neither um, painful nor pleasant that arises with eye contact as condition. Now, when one abides inflamed by the lust and lust is the desire, I like this, I want it, attachment in your mind, you are fettered, chained up, binded, infatuated, can't stop thinking about it, contemplating gratification, contemplating pleasant experience. And then the five aggregates affected by clinging are built up for oneself in the future, meaning what's happening for you now, going through it this way, you tuck it in your mind and you're gonna start thinking about it again in the future, you're storing it. 
and one's craving, which brings renewal of being. Now, if we take this word being and we say renewal um, of habitual tendencies, try this for the here and now, for right now in life, is accompanied, renewal of habitual tendencies is accompanied by delight and lust and delights in this and that, and it increases. So your habitual tendency to want, want, want something a whole lot and want to hold on to it and have lust after it and everything like that increases when it's in your head and you're thinking about it and you're not in the present time capsule. You're not just moving through life. This is what I'm saying. You watch and you see when this happens in life, see if you can catch yourself. One's bodily and mental troubles increase. One's bodily and mental torments increase. One's bodily and mental fevers increase. And one experiences bodily and mental suffering. This means those habits of getting angry and irritated with this or that all come back up and repeat. And when that happens, you have trouble with your mind, with your body, with repeating. You get heated with discussions and actions again and again, and you experience bodily and mental suffering. But when one does not know and see the ear as it actually is, the same thing happens. And when one does not know and see the nose or not see the tongue or not see the body as it actually is. When one does not know and see these things as they actually are and the mind as well, one experiences bodily and mental suffering in the same way. So your experience as you go through it, this is why this drill the Buddha gave in 148 in this Chachaka Sutta was so important. And we can take it and use it today. This is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. This is not who I am. This is just what's happening. It wasn't here. It's arising. It is here and it will pass away. That's Anicca. So you're realizing Anicca. You're realizing Dukkha. And you're realizing the cause of this craving is triggered by Atta, taking things personally and the way out. Now listen and see. When one knows and sees the eye as it actually is, one knows and sees the forms as they actually are and the eye consciousness and the eye contact and the eye feeling felt as pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant. And it arises from the eye for forms, for eye consciousness, for eye contact, for the feeling felt as pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant that arises with eye contact as condition. Then when one abides uninflamed by lust, they are unfettered, uninfatuated, contemplating danger, meaning they understand what the danger of being attached is, they have that knowledge. So they're, they're contemplating the danger. And then the five aggregates affected by clinging are diminished for oneself in the future and one's craving, which brings the renewal of habitual tendencies and be behaviors is accompanied by by delight and lust and, de and delights in this and that they are abandoned. One's bodily and mental troubles are abandoned. One's Hello, Sister Kemal, we cannot hear you. Sister Kemal, we can't hear you.
You're all okay. We could not hear you. I came something. back. Okay. Can you hear me? You hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, good. So the view of a person such as this is right view and his intention is right intention. His effort is right effort, mindfulness, right mindfulness, concentration, right concentration, bodily action, verbal action, and his livelihood have, uh, now this one line is not right. Bunty always points this out. It says, um, his bodily action, verbal action, and livelihood have already been well purified earlier. That's straight from the commentary. It's not in the text at all. And this was included in here. This is an example of where Nanamoli tended to live in that direction uh, with wanted certain things included. And this um, was where they started breaking down the Eightfold Path. The problem with this is it gives you the picture of if you ignore those three pieces and say they've already been completed before, they have nothing to do with what we're doing now. That means that you're attempting to do go down the path without the support of the whole eight pieces of the eightfold path. And that's not because it's just kind of a small whoops that happened. But if you take a piece of paper and uh, an eight by 11 paper, fold it in half, um, the, the, the wide, not the long way, but the, wide, the width of it, fold it in half four times and you have eight folds. And then turn it into a fan and fan yourself and you can get cool. Now take a pair of scissors and cut three of those off and open it up and there's only five and you can barely move the wind enough to get cool at all. It's kind of funny, but that's not real. You have to have all of those being functioning all the time. Thus, this noble aidful path comes to fulfillment in him by development. When he develops the eightfold path, four foundations of mindfulness come to fulfillment in him by development. And the four kinds of right striving, four bases of spiritual power, five faculties, five powers, seven enlightenment factors come to fulfillment in him. By development, these two things, serenity and insight, simultaneously occur in him, yoked evenly together. Okay. He fully understands by direct knowledge, by knowing, by seeing. So direct knowledge is the same thing as knowing by seeing. Those things that should fully be understood by direct knowledge, he abandons by um, direct knowledge, those things that should be abandoned by direct knowledge. And he develops by direct knowledge the things that should be developed by direct knowledge and realizes the direct knowledge, those things that should be realized by direct knowledge. And all of this is coming, all of the knowledge that we're showing you tied together and woven together and balanced perfectly. And what things should be fully understood by direct knowledge? The answer to that is, and this, if you look on your booklet from the retreats, you're gonna find the five aggregates of, and how they're affected by clinging. And that is the material aggregate, form aggregate, the feeling aggregate, the perception aggregate, the formations aggregate, and the consciousness aggregate when affected by clinging, how they is a problem, but not affected by clinging, craving and clinging. There is no problem if you understand it and let it be just as it is. And what things should be abandoned by direct knowledge? And this is interesting. It, the sutta says, ignorant and craving for being in another life, but also if step back into the present time in your practice and say it again, ignorance and craving for habitual behavior patterns that you did before, because now you're beginning to respond. You're not 
running the same behavior patterns anymore. Now you're starting to, to change. Okay. And then it says what things should be abandoned by direct knowledge. And it is this ignorance, this craving for these habitual patterns. And also you're letting go of the Atta perspective. You've shifted it into Anatta perspective. And that's what helps you to unbind. And these are the things that should be abandoned by direct knowledge or knowledge and vision where you get to see it for yourself. What things should be developed by direct knowledge? Ah, serenity and insight. These are the things that should be developed by direct knowledge. And what things should be developed, realized by direct knowledge? True knowledge and deliverance. The truth of how things actually are and the wisdom of how to use that information to become free from suffering. And when one, um, let's see, when one knows and sees the ear as it actually is, the nose as it actually is, the tongue as it actually is, the body as it actually is, the mind as it actually is, then these are the things that should be realized by direct knowledge. So those are the things that should be realized. And what do we show you within your training for TWIM? that helps you to see and understand this most clearly. The links in the practice chart for human cognition, dependent co-arising. And you by watching them, learning them and watching them all around you in people's interactions and such, on the, any place you go and watch it, you begin to understand how this really works. It's really good. So this is what the blessed one said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted with the blessed one's word. And this was almost near the end of the Majjhima Nikaya, number 149. And the sutta is a, a really nice way to, it's very short to read it through that way. And it's nice for you to be able to see that when you're practicing twim, you are fulfilling all of that knowledge and vision and all of that that was described. I think that's what I like the most about it. So anybody have any questions about that one? Okay. So um, we did, uh, let's see, what time is it, Bunty? Because I still don't have my clock. Okay, it's 7.53. Um, we can break if everybody's okay with that because I'm pretty tired from today's adventures. <laughs> Is that okay? Does anybody have a question they want to say? Anybody there? Okay, so let's just do our prayer, okay? May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. If you have any questions, Please write me, let me know. And I'm happy to, I have some questions from, from May, but she wasn't here. So I, um, I kind of held off on those, but if you have any, send them to Kanti Kama2 at gmail.com, okay? okay? Thank you very much, sister. You're very welcome, Sadu, Sadu, Sadu. Thank you. Uh. All right.